Today we're talking about why belief in reality is a dangerous mistake as well as how the real has become the god of science. It's going to be good. So we're taking a look at this article called The Fantasy of Reality on IAI.TV. Highly recommend them. They're a great website. And uh, this is by Hillary Lawson. And this is going to make sense in the context of what we're talking about. So let's just start real quick and, and we'll see what what uh, what this has to do with today's topic. So most of us, most of the time, have the sense that we are connected to the real. And remember, today's topic is why the belief in reality is a dangerous idea. And what we're going to see here is that the idea of the real, and when I say the idea of the real, we're talking about how um, people who are realists understand what is real and how people in the scientific community understand what is real. Not what is really real, as we'll find out in a minute, but let's just continue here. So most of us, most of the time, have the sense that we are connected to the real, the immediate world around us, the objects and people, the buildings in the natural, uh, natural world seem unquestionably present, not only in the sense that we are experiencing them, but in the sense that they exist independently of us out there in the real world. Okay, so here's, that's the important part. When you are taking a realist position, you are saying that you can have an existence, a real existence that is independent from the mind. See, now this is where um, you come into conflict with what we know, because we know that mind is primary and everything out there depends on mind for its existence. So the idea that the real is that which is mind independent could exist without mind is a very dangerous idea. That they would exist, the things, the objects would exist independently, independently of us out there in the real world. Well, they, they don't and they can't. It is a product of our mental content. So let's continue here. Some we might imagined slightly crazed philosophers may have doubted the existence of those objects in the real world and proposed that it's all a dream and a product of our subjective imagination. Well, I'm offended. <laughs> um, so look, we, we don't think that it's a product of just our own personal subjective imagination, but it is all a dream. But it's a persistent stable dream. It's a persistent and stable dream that is formed by the uh, collective, like all of us together. It's a shared dream. So that's important to remember is that this is not like some solipsistic, uh, solipsistic, uh, solipsistic position where, uh, we believe that just one of us is, is the only conscious entity in existence or something in that sense. Um, so anyway, we feel we know better, aside from moments of mental instability or those who have taken rather too many psycho uh, psychoactive substances, we have an abiding sense that the world we experience is, experience is for the most part only too real. Uh, this notion of reality is so close to us and so central to our culture that it's hard for us to imagine how it could be otherwise. Now, do you see how like ingrained that this is, that the idea that what is out there is is really real and that it can exist independently from us. It's so ingrained that this uh, article is assuming that this is the belief of, of, of everyone who's going to read this article and that you would have to be sort of like a crazed philosopher or someone who partakes in psychoactive substances to think otherwise. Well, hey, I mean, those crazed philosophers um, are pretty damn smart and the psychoactive substances reveal quite a lot about the nature of reality. But let's continue reading here. So um, basically what, what they're saying here is that the fact that people believe that what's out there exists independently of us is the common consensus. But it's not always been so. Our confidence in our access to the real is no doubt in part a product of the success of the Enlightenment and the remarkable achievements of science over the last 350 years. Philosophical realism, the idea that such an independent reality can be described by us, has within academic philosophy been supported by many in the analytic school. I have argued, however, that it is a mistake, a mistake that limits our ability to intervene successfully in the world 
and encourages division and conflict. So opening this article, you would you would think that this person is almost mocking those who reject realism and kind of making fun of those who reject realism and saying, well, obviously the real is what's true. But you can see that they were actually just sort of being um, sarcastic about it because their position is that realism is false. Their position is that it is a mistake to believe that uh, such an independent reality can be described by us. And it's a mistake that limits our ability to intervene successfully in the world and encourage division and conflict. And this is the exact stance of Hyperionism. Now, not the stance of this person, because this, this person takes what I believe a post-realist stance. That is not our position. But we have the th in common that we, we both reject philosophical realism, and we also both have in common that philosophical realism leads to our inability to intervene successfully in the world, and it encourages division and conflict. Because when you have the idea that reality exists independently from us, you are automatically intrinsically incorporating division within your system. Because there is us, and there is the world, and then there are others. And these are all independent uh, systems, divided. However, in Hyperionism, which is a mathematical idealism, this is all part of our collective experience. This is our collective realm. That So Hyperionism is, is an idealism. Mind is primary. And so everything is inherently united, not divided. And these ideas are exactly the kind of ideas that we need to overcome because this is what leads to conflict, division, strife, hatred, homophobia, sexism. All this, the humans are so conditioned and, 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 and into seeing things as being other, different, opposite. And, you know, you can kind of understand why. Because we live in a world that seems very divided and that, oh, well, you know, this, this pen is over here and not here. And, and you are there and I am me. It seems like that this is a very demarcated, delineated um, world. But that's not true. This is just the way that um, left hemispheric functions sort of, sort of categorize and delineate things. Ultimately, what is true is that underneath that all, we are all united. We are all a unity. Now, we, all, we do have individual existence as minds. We are each individual eternal minds, but we exist in a network and that network mind, that monadic neural network, that network mind, together is what generates the realm of space-time. And you see, this is what when, when the world starts to become a much more united place, when one realizes that. Because, for example, let's take, uh, you know, this, um, uh, this Rubik's Cube, for example. If we look at this Rubik's Cube, now what is this? For, for a philosophical realist, this is an object that just exists independently from you and I. It is its own object. If, if all the minds in existence didn't exist, this Rubik's Cube would, would still exist. If you wipe them all out instantly, this would still be there. Not so in Hyperionism, because in Hyperionism, reality is a Fourier transform of frequency information. So ultimately, what does that mean? It means that this, underneath it all, is a wave structure composed of frequency information. Okay. Now, where does this frequency information come from? This frequency information originates from each and every one of us. So each and every one of us contributes to this object. So why is this important? Why are we even talking about this? Because that means that this object, first of all, isn't separate from us. It is us and it's shared by us. Like even though I might say, well, this is mine because it's in my house in my hand and I paid for it. Well, putting all that bullshit aside, this is a shared object because this object is composed of all of our frequency contents together, has a little bit of all of us inside of it and forming it. Now, do you see how this way of looking at the world ultimately has an effect on the way we perceive things and behave and treat each other? People always wonder like, well, what, what is Hyperionism? How does it help practically? Like, well, how does it help to know all these things? What you think about reality shapes, shapes our world, even if you don't know it. This underlying idea of division is what starts 
you know, parsing everything up into different like competing nationalistic countries where, oh, we're these people and you're those people and you're the alien, you're the foreigner, you're inferior, you're evil, because everything is, no. The idea here is to change one's perspective and realize that we exist in a world that is a product of our creation and everything is shared by us in that all objects are literally composed of our own internal frequency. So again, this object, it's really important to understand this because this starts to shape the way you see the world. You start to see others and the world as expressions of yourself and ourselves and we're all in this together instead of seeing things as other, separate, alien, strange, weird, different. Now, diversity is beautiful. Diversity is wonderful. But it's about celebrating that diversity, selling, celebrating that um, difference in a way where it's like, oh, wow, you're different than me? That's amazing. Can you, like, I want to learn about that. I, you know, tell me about this. Help me, like, understand. Help me, like, let's, let's all help complete each other by providing each other the pieces of information that one of us that we we are each lacking or not doesn't have you see the difference you don't hate others because of their diversity and difference you rather share that in a learning experience to create a more cohesive unity now of course if the individual is just a hateful asshole that's a different story like if we're talking about some you know if someone is racist or something, you don't want to be like, oh, wow, really? Let me learn about that. That's that's completely different because that goes against the idea of unity itself. And that and that is a is a separating function and is harmful. So it's not not about accepting everything, but everything that contributes to unity, growth, um, actualization, quality of life. Anyway, let's let's continue this. But but I really, you know, it, it's so important the way you look at the world. And that's the reason why I'm taking some time to talk about this because, you know, I was a Christian for many years. When you're a Christian, you look at the world completely different. This object, this object is a creation of God. Like ultimately, God created this. God created everything around you. And you view the world in a different way. You are a creation of God. You are owned by God. And everything is owned by God. And we must please God. And then when I went from Christianity to, uh, I was agnostic, scientific materialist, leaning towards, but leaning towards materialism. So when, you, when, you, when I went from there, this object no longer became a creation of God, but it became an independent object composed of material atoms. So do you see how th the way you view reality changes drastically, dramatically, and that changes how you operate, that changes how you act, that changes how you interact with your with others and, and everything and we live in such a shit world because people have no idea what's going on and everyone is operating under a different assumption um you know you have people who, who who believe in a creator god and think they are the world is owned by god so everything should be done the way god says and then you have you know materialist science who says well everything exists independently and so is you know separate from us and other and this creates a world of of division ultimately and, and a misunderstanding of what we are where we are and why we're here and so it's really important because even if you don't know that these things are shaping how you behave they do they seep into your unconscious. They seep into society. They seep into culture and they uh, uh, affect everything. So it's important to remember what the real is because if you get the real wrong, you're going to have a real hard time on your hands. You have to know what is real. What is real is not an in mind independent reality. What is real is us. We are real. What you are most intimately familiar with your subjective experience. That is the only thing that you have ever experienced is your subjective experience. You've never, you've never experienced a mind independent reality. You've never experienced a mind independent reality. It would be impossible because you are a mind. You can't experience a mind independent reality. You might think like this Rubik's cube. Oh, I, it's, I'm experiencing a mind independent reality. No, you're experiencing it through your mind. It is impossible to experience a mind-independent reality. Why is it impossible to experience a mind-independent reality? Because such a reality doesn't exist. All reality is dependent on mind. And no one has ever, not once for a second, experienced a mind-independent reality because that's a literal logical impossibility. 
So again, so much for empiricism, which says what is what can be observed is true. Not once has a mind independent reality ever been observed. Not once has a matter ever been observed. You know, materialist science, empirical science. So oh, matter is true. And how, how do we know what is true? Through observation. Matter has never once been observed. You, well, well, I'm observing it right now. Matter is that which exists independently from mind. And so when you're observing this, you can't say that you're observing matter because matter is that which exists independently from mind. So you can't observe something that exists independently of mind. Anyway, let's... <laughs> I barely read the like one paragraph here. Um, <laughs> so the idea of a reality that we can uncover through precise observation and reason is at the heart of the Enlightenment and enabled its advocates to champion human capacity over the authority of the Word of God. As children of the Enlightenment, we are taught the story of Galileo with the metaphysical moral that by peering through his telescope, he was able to observe the reality of the Jupiter's moons and challenge the power and authority of the church. Reality, though, turns out itself to be a theological notion. For the real, like God, is not in the end observable. This is important. Nor can we give an account for how our theories are able to reach through our experience and our particular context to describe an independent reality that we can identify as the ultimate character of the world. So what's being said here? This is really interesting. What essentially is being said here is that just like religious individuals, Christians or whoever, have God that for enlightenment thinkers or or well not all enlightenment thinkers but let's just take sci scientific materialists like science of today their god is the real meaning a mind independent existence that's their god why is it their god well because you have to have faith that it exists you cannot observe it and you cannot produce a theory that satisfactorily uh, accounts for how that could be. So do you see it's very interesting? Is that, yeah, sure, they got rid of the theological notion of a creator God, but they replaced it with an, with, with, with an idea that requires just as much faith. And that is the idea of a mind-independent existence. Because a mind-independent existence has never been observed. You know, just like God has never been observe people go you know the scientific materialists will, will mock religious individuals and be like oh yeah oh, god exists where is he all right well a mind independent reality exists where is it show it to me where it where you can't you by definition cannot it cannot be shown and uh furthermore a coherent consistent uh uh theory cannot be produced that shows how a mind independent reality could be so in the end, you need faith. So that's how the real, as in a mind-independent reality, becomes uh, the God, that which you must have faith in for scientists. This is important to understand. Um, and yeah, and so it's great that the enlightenment, I always say, I was writing about this in my book very recently, the enlightenment is sort of two steps forward and one step back. You get rid of the idea of God, you get rid of the authority of the church, and that's all great, and you start moving towards, um, you know, using reason, but then empiricism, materialism, physicalism do dominated. And that's where we get the uh, notion, you know, with like Newtonian mechanics became uh, dominant. And that's where we got the notion, you know, it became very dominant that reality is material, exists independently from the mind. We're just dead, lifeless matter. That's it. So it was, you know, two steps forward. Great for getting rid of the theological creator God notion. I mean, attempting to at least in some capacity and uh, bypassing the authority of the church. But... But, 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 unfortunately, the nihilistic rise of materialism started dominating the dialectical flow of reality. And that's not good because now we have uh, meaninglessness. We have uh, 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 absolute, um, uh, you know, division and misunderstanding of our purpose. It's purposelessness. There is no purpose in a materialist view. So, but, but let's, let's continue. 
So yet realism involves the presumption of something that accounts for all there is, support, supports our theories, is found everywhere, but is inaccessible and indescribable. Such descriptions are strangely similar to those that have been used by monotheists to describe their god. For a simple reason, the real is the god of the Enlightenment, or of today's modern uh, scientists, scientific materialists. And yeah, so let me let me actually just continue reading here. And by the way, I, I just always want to emphasize that things are real. We're not denying that there's nothing nothing that's real. There are real things. There is an objective truth. This is not a uh, like a post realist position. You can come to re real truth, but real truth is is mind, not matter. They have a they have looked at an illusion and declared it to be real. They, they, they were enamored by the magician pulling the rabbit out of the hat. And they were like, oh, my God, what a, how did he? Wow. What magical powers that individual has? I'm, I'm kidding. But so they so likewise, they have looked at the apparent um, distinct objects around them and have come to the conclusion that those objects are distinct from themselves without incorporating their own subjectivity into their framework, forgetting the part that the individual doing the looking, the mind that's doing the looking is what's fundamental. Do you see? It's such a subtle point, but it's so it's subtle and obvious at the same time and so important. And I think it just flies by so many people. But it's so important that, you know, people think, oh, well, it's matter that's fundamental. Oh, really? T tell me again how matter is fundamental subjective entity that is required to even make that statement do you see how that subjective uh experience that being a subjective experiential entity that's what's fundamental you could not have the experience of that supposed distinct matter without being a subjectivity that is what is fundamental and this is what's so you know brilliant about descartes cogito i think therefore i i am people that's a very profound statement it's the fundamental of um, mind being and ultimately reason when we when we look at it carefully. Um, it's 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 an incredibly, incredibly uh, important and and um, crucial conclusion. Um, anyway, I won't get into that today. I'm very I'm kind of going from topic to topic. And, and just so, so you know, we are not dualists. Uh, some people think, oh, Hyperionism, they're, they're dualists like like Descartes. No, Descartes had some very good ideas. The, the, the cogito, I think, therefore I am, is extremely important. But we're not dualists. We're idealists, meaning that mind is primary. Everything is ultimately mind when it comes down to it. So, of course, the vision of the early scientists and philosophers of the Enlightenment was a great and profound one, and that was to transform the circumstances of everyone. Instead of the idea that the world was either unknowable or our knowledge of it came from a higher authority, the proposition that we are capable of uncovering the character of the world from our own observations and investigations was a liberating and transformational shift that propelled research and discovery. And I agree 100%. So it's like two steps forward, but that one step back. So... Um, it heralded a new age in which we could see human history as a continuous form of progress that gradually provided a more and more accurate account of the world. And of course, that's um, not not true. You know, we know this uh, from uh, uh, is it Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn's book, um, who who uh, popularized the word um, paradigm with relating to uh, scientific structures. Anyway. Um, People think that science sort of progresses in, with linear progression. It doesn't. It progresses through uh, revolution and paradigm shifts. So it's not this continual uh, march of um, progression towards understanding reality more accurately and more accurately. Uh, it, it is a series of internal revolutions overthrowing and establishing new paradigms like the paradigm of you know newtonian like you have aristotelian physics and then like newtonian mechanics and then uh uh einsteinian relativity and quantum mechanics you have all these different par paradigms 
that instate in uh, that are completely different ways, completely different ways of looking at the world. And for and 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 in any case, science has no business in saying what reality is, uh, because that's the realm of metaphysics, which they deny. So they should stick to their realm of of modeling and describing reality, not offering any sort of uh, explanation. Okay, so it led to great theories of science that seemingly uncovered the underlying laws that governed the universe and accurately described its development. Uh, they pragmatically did. They pragmatically did, but not accurately in an ontological sense. The problem is that the Enlightenment strategy of observing the world and applying reason to determine what is actually the case has uncovered its own limitation and failure, identifying our inability to describe reality. Okay, so one thing that I want to say real quick here. This is uh, an annoyance of mine. Okay, so let's look at that again. The problem is that the Enlightenment strategy of observing the world and applying reason to determine what's actually the case has uncovered its own limitation to failure. So there is this very annoying um, tendency to equate science, observation, and reason sort of as, as, as one, like, it, like it's all sort of the same and goes together. There is a big difference between reason and observation. Uh, in fact, rationalism and empiricism are opposites. They're opposing schools of, of epistemology. So science is not rationalist, it's empiricist. They use reason, but they use reason to support their empirical observations. So there's sort of like a hierarchy. They use reason, but only as a servant of their empirical observations to support these things. So what this person is saying, they're kind of grouping all this together. It's not that reason has a limitation. It's the way that science uses reason that has a limitation. Reason itself does, does not have, have a limitation. Uh, I've done videos on like Kant's antinomies who tries, they try, you know, Kant tries to show the limitations of reason. Reason has no, has no limitations because this world is reason. This is a rational world. And when I say a rational world, I don't mean like people behave irrationally, but that it follows laws and structures. It's, um, basically means that miracles can't exist. Absolute randomness can't exist. True randomness, which is true chaos, not pseudo randomness, like a roll of the dice, uh, roll, roll of the roll of the dice. That's pseudo randomness, not not true randomness. Uh, a random number generator. That's pseudo randomness, not true. I did a whole video on randomness, uh, but so anyway, very important to understand that this grouping of science, reason, and empiricism together, and sort of condemning them all. I mean, yeah, condemn science and empiricism, but don't put reason in there. It's not reason's fault. It's uh, science's flawed use of reason. Okay, let's, let me, because this is taking a little while. I'm So let, let's, let's kind of get to the different parts here. So, uh, So in addition, the idea that we are able to accurately describe an independent reality requires a theory about how our theories and language are hooked onto the world. If you're going to use language to try and describe an independent uh, reality, you have to understand how language corresponds to the world. Yet no such theory to support realism has been forthcoming. Indeed, there has been a shortage of any theories that lay out clearly the metaphysics required to make a realist account of the world possible. Yeah, you can't because it's impossible. And they're just emphasizing the fact that there there is no... Um, you know, complete, consistent theory out there that can make a realist account of the world possible. At a common sense level, we assume that our world refers to things out there. Oh, we assume that our words refer to things out there in the world. Providing an account of how they do so and what sort of things there must be to make this possible becomes more perplexing the more it's pursued. Now, I'll comment on this. This is really important. So Wittgenstein, close to the beginning of analytic philosophy, was one of the few to follow through the metaphysics required to make a realist account of language. Critically, however, he concluded that any attempt to describe the relationship between language and the world must fail. It must do so because such a theory would itself have to stand outside of language in order to catch sight of how language itself relates to the world. Now, Wittgenstein is absolutely correct, but here's the thing. R language 
So Wittgenstein says that any attempt to describe language in the world must fail. Yes, it cannot do so 100% a- accurately. And this is because the world is not made of language, not human language at least. It's made of the eternal mathematical language of existence, frequency patterns. So when I say reality, you know, of course, of course you can't use, let's say, English to describe a world 100% accurately that's not made of English. Only, only if the world was literally made of English could you use English to 100% describe reality because then there would be no mediation. The thing that it is would be referring to the thing that it is. So there'd be no mediation. It'd be 100% accurate. Now, the issue is, is that this is a mathematical reality. So when you try to apply language to mathematics, you're not going to get an accurate. It's not going to be 100% accurate. You can get a degree of accuracy. Sure. It can be pragmatically useful, but it's not going to be 100% accurate. So the idea here is that you, you get any, any time you're not using the thing itself to describe itself, you get mediation and then there is a loss of accuracy. So it goes, it goes through something. You see how if I am observing something that whatever, like whatever, whatever it is out there, right? This, this thing that is out here isn't the way that you observe it. This is being filtered through your sense data and your perceptions, and it's being organized according to your mind and sensory data. Like there is the thing that is out here, the thing in itself, and then there is your experience of the thing in itself as your sensory organs, you know, receive the the data input from reflected light and everything else associated with it, and then organize that information into something that you can coherently cognize. But you see how there, you're not directly experiencing this. It's going through a mediation, a filter of your senses to give you an experience that is not the thing in itself. It's your filtered mediated experience. So the only way that you can 100% get to the thing in itself is to use the thing that it is to describe itself. And the thing that it is, is mathematics. And so we can use mathematics to accurately describe reality because reality is math describing itself. We are living mathematical beings. And when I say math, I don't mean abstract math. I mean living ontological mathematics. Um, and once again, if you've never heard of ontological mathematics, you can uh, learn about it in my book, Ontological Mathematics, The Science of the Future, or in the um, books by some of the pioneers of ontological mathematics, uh, Mike Hockney and Dr. Thomas Stark. And this has information on math if you never heard it. But long story short, this is not abstract math like math on paper. This is living mathematics in terms of frequency um, that follows the principle of sufficient reason. So my point is, is that yes, language is inaccurate because language does not accurately describe what's out here. So what is this thing? What is this thing? This thing ultimately is a, it's a wave structure. It's a composition of frequency and a wave function. So you can imagine what this actually is 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 a wave structure but this is flowing out if, if you were able to see the waves associated with this you would see well, when we look at this this seems very clearly demarcated there's a there's a part where it starts and it ends but if you were to look at this that wouldn't you know if you were able to somehow view its wave co- uh, composition that wouldn't be the case it, it is connected to everything else. It exists in this, you know, there, there, everything is connected to everything. And so if you were able to see this, it would be a wave structure that, that ultimately is connected to everything and is in motion. And we call this a cube. But it's not a cube. That's just a, a, a sound that we have associated with our own limited and pragmatic demarcation of a wave structure that is ultimately connected to everything that we have demarcated into a specific um, area and have labeled a cube. I, it, it, like if you think of a tree, right? If you think of a tree, we look at a tree and go, oh, you know, that thing there, that is a tree. But that tree isn't really a separate thing. It's, 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 you know, uh, gaining the, it's connected to the light from the sun that it's absorbing and the oxygen that is being emitted. And it has its roots that go into the ground and the ground becomes the earth. 
it's only our arbitrary human language and words that we we assign that specific thing a tree and say the tree stop, starts here, stops here, and ends here. It's connected to everything. It's connected to the entire environment. Everything is connected to everything and creates all of everything as a whole. And there are different par, different elements of that whole, but they're not disconnected. They're all connected to each other. Again, like the the tree, air, light, um, uh, roots, earth, ground, grass. And then the entirety of the world is all part of the same. And then the universe is all part of the same structure. And so, again, we could see, if we could see that wave uh, structure of that tree, we would see that it, it, it flows into everything. And so what actually is out there is, is this wave structure. But we as humans go, oh, that's a tree. It's not a tree. It's a, it's a wave structure that relates to reality in a uh, holistic way. And yes, it's, we have to call it something to be pragmatic about it. But you can see that that thing, because what was it before? Well, it was, it was a sapling. What was it before? A sprout. What was it before? A seed. But when does the, when, when does the sprout become the sapling and when does the sapling become the tree? There's no clear part where it's like, oh, it's a sapling, but oh, now it's a, no, it's, 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 it's a process in motion. And so if you were to, this, this is a, a living mathematical system that is in motion and unfolding from that seed and its growth, the sprout and the sapling and the tree, it's a wave process that is unfolding. So do you see how it's wrong to go, oh, that's a seed, that's a sprout. That's a sapling. That's a tree. These are still static sounds that we are attaching to a fluid, moving, evolving structure. So it's false to say that that is a tree. That's just a pragmatic tool that we use to be able to refer to things. And we need that. But it's important to understand why there is a limitation there. So despite Wittgenstein's identification of the impossibility of a realist theory of language. So yeah, that's that's my point. Wittgenstein was like, well, we can we can't use language to accurately describe reality. Of course not. But we can use mathematics to accurately describe reality because it is math. It's it's math describing math and we are math. So ultimately, it's just one system understanding and exploring itself. And um, I hope when I say, I know it can sound rather dry when I go, we are math, but I mean it in the, in, in, in the context of living mathematical frequency. We are living mathematical frequency. Everything is living mathematical frequency. We are um, living mathematical frequency beings and structures that, are, that have generated this world and we have placed ourselves in this world and are experiencing ourselves and each other as different aspects um, of ourselves and within a network. So many philosophers of the analytic school have continued to pursue the realist project, the idea that there's a mind-independent reality. Though usually without making any seri serious attempt to develop an ontology that could make sense of how this could be achieved. So basically, a lot of philosophers kept believing in a mind-independent reality, but they never made any serious attempt to develop a theory in which they described ontologically as in what is actually real like how it could how how that could actually be well because it's impossible you can't you have to include the mind it's so you, oh. oh sorry my rant is getting siri to uh describe ontology for some reason i don't know why um but anyway humans are are, are so strange in that look it's so strange to me humans are we are subjective centers of experience. We're subjectivities. We're, we're, we're thinking, experiencing things, okay? You have this, say, a scientist or, or whoever, empiricist, whatever, and they want to come up with, with an, a theory about the world. But they refuse to include what they are in that theory. Do you see how weird that is? I, as a subjective entity... I'm going to come up with a theory of the world that excludes subjective entities as being necessary. Uh, they create a system, that, the, the subjective entity creates a system that refuses to include itself in its system. 
And do you see this uh, total lack of consciousness? It's a, it's a lack of awareness. You know, you have instinctual animals that are sentient and can experience pleasure, feeling, you know, pain, their, you know, feelings, love, all, all that. But they don't have a sense of, oh, I am a dog and, and whatever. Of course not. We humans do. We, we realize, oh, I am a person and I am, you know, this is my name and this is my family. And we have all these ideas that we associate to ourselves and this forms the ego complex. But you have to have an even high. Do you see where um, at a certain point? There's another level of consciousness that you need to get to that scientific materialists don't have because they, as the subjective entity, create a theory that doesn't conclude, they include themselves. The subjective entity creates a theory that does not include the subjective entity within itself because it, it's, like it has, it's like it's not aware of itself. It has forgotten that it is the thing that is doing the construction. Anyway. We're not going to get through this. Um, we're not going to get through this article. If you want to read this article, check out this this website. I like it a lot. I don't agree with everything in here, by the way. This this individual, Hillary Lawson, seems like a very interesting individual. But they're a post-realist, which I don't agree with. Um, but they have very good, interesting points. I'm just I'm trying because I'm I'm trying to see if I can make this shorter. So furthermore, realists often assume that the abandonment of the real has the consequence that anything goes, that each perspective is equally valuable. Uh, the strength and successes of the Enlightenment, our understanding of the world and our culture is imagined to be at risk if we give up the real and with it the notion that we are correct and that there are correct and incorrect uh, accounts of the world. So this is uh, not true. You know, there's sort of this idea of, well, if we get up a mind independent reality and how are we going to know what's true? Everyone can just believe what they want. It's going to be chaos. No, that's not that's not true at all. This is a weird false dichotomy. We can understand what reality is, like I said, mathematically and rationally. And this is infinitely superior to observation and, you know, a flawed materialist understanding of reality. So we can be much more rigorous than uh, like these materialist empirical ideas. So you know, long story short is that – let me see here. Lo, yeah, I – God, I, I didn't there, – there's a lot more to this article. If you want to read it, you can. Um, but long story short, th this individual, Hillary Lawson, I completely agree with the, uh, their, their position that uh, realism is false. There is no mind-independent reality. Uh, that's, that does not exist. There is a real reality, and that real reality is uh, us, in that we are subjective minds that are the source and generator of all this reality through the interactions of our uh, myriad frequency components. And so that's the thing. You have to know. It's not that the real doesn't exist. You have to be very careful that you don't mistake the an illusion for being the real. And that's what most people have done, is that they go, oh, hey, look at all these things out there. They're real and they exist apart from me. And it's just so, like, obviously not. It's, it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's taking the illusion to be true. And, you know, humanity just has a long way to go. And we, we got to cut our work cut out. This is why education and spreading Hyperionism and this sort of information is really important because we desperately need that raising of consciousness so that we don't live in this hateful, divided world that sees everyone as alien and other and inferior and evil based on whatever nationalist, you know, like I see what's going on in the world right now with regard to like Russia and Ukraine. And you have these people that are this, I'm trying to choose my words carefully because of, you know, Facebook, YouTube algorithms and all that. But you have these two opposing sides that are, you know, destroying each other. But can you imagine, you know, like, you know, say this Russian guy here, this Ukrainian guy over here, if they were just, you know, they're they're trying to kill each other. But if if such if the circumstances were different, if this person were born in this country and this one were there, they'd be on the opposite sides. You know what I'm saying? It's just because they just so happened to be born in the place that they were born and raised in their nationalistic way that they're on the on the particular sides that they are. 
if 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 the Russian was born in Ukraine, the Ukrainian was born in Russian, they would be it would be the completely reversed. It's it's this um divided world that sees others as inferior, evil, um, and uh, uh, you know alien outsider. And this this stems. There's so many things that this stems from. Not just the idea that of of that a mind independent reality exists and that division is is um, inherent in um, the way that the whole of physical domain operates. There's a lot to it. I mean, there's there's religion, there's culture, there's so 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 much going. You know, political uh, ideology. But ultimately, when you get down to it, we need to understand what reality is, because when you understand what reality is, you're going to understand that we're all part of this connected system together and we're in this together and we're here to learn and grow uh, and do so in a healthy way together and not to destroy that which we don't understand. We are here to learn from that which we don't understand. Now, we don't want to be accepting of, of, of hateful things like again, like I said. If someone's a racist, don't be like, oh, well, I don't understand that. Enlighten me. No, no, no. Obviously not. Obviously not. But I think you understand what I mean. If someone is um, different in a way that is, you know, culturally different in that, uh, you know, uh, it's just gross to me how I see so many people hateful on other people for the dumbest reasons, like the color of their skin or their 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 gender identity or oh, people are awful and they hate each other for these things. And um, it's really sad and disgusting. And we have to realize that we're all just in this together and here to learn and grow and, and, and understand in this world. And we have to get rid of so many uh, misunderstandings, hateful ideologies. You know, religion is a huge impediment to this. Um, scientific materialists as well, ultimately like capitalism and the rich billionaire class as well. Because I mean, look, look how this spreads into everything. This spreads into everything, like even capitalism, All right? Oh, you know, this is my money and this is my house and this is my car and this is my yacht and screw you. Uh, you see, but if you understand, well, I mean, honestly, no one really owns anything. This is all ours because we all contributed to it. Now, of course, yes, we, we can have, you know, we doesn't mean you should just be able to walk into someone's house and start eating from their fridge or something like obviously not. Like, come on. That's not what I mean. But you can see how this uh, these ideas permeate into everything, even if you don't realize, even if it's not consciously realized, it permeates into everything. And that's why when we have this consciousness shift, you know, bringing humanity to hyper awareness, um, you know, one of the elements is, is seeing this interconnected state of the world and imagine how much a better world that we will have uh when when you know this is this is realized so um and, and i'm man i keep getting off topic tonight but uh so so anyway hillary lawson points out that the real uh as a mind independent reality is ridiculous um points out that it causes division uh points out that it has become the god of uh, what they call the enlightenment, but um, I, I would say applies to scientific materialists today as well. And uh, I agree with all that. However, they are a post-realist and um, I don't agree with that. So, so post-realism, so post-realism encourages new, okay, so let me, let me show you. There's some interesting things here. So post-realism encourages new theories and ways of seeing. Good. Though these need to be constrained by a single-minded focus on following through the consequences of a given framework and by applying rigorous, rational, and empirical principles to examine and test the concepts employed. Also good. That's all fantastic. We're in agreement there. So post-realism offers a solution to a highly dangerous world of competing perspectives where everyone supposes that they are right. Namely, we give up believing we are right and the belief that there is a right to be found. There's a problem. There's a problem. Okay. So post-realism offers a solution to a highly dangerous world of competing perspectives where everyone supposes they are right. That, so, yes, we, well, Hyperionism offers this um, because we don't, ba we base it on reason. We don't just go, oh, hey, well, this is our idea. Well, isn't your idea reason? No, no, no. Reason is just what is, what is true. It, it, you know, again, as simple as two plus two equals four. I mean, if you, if you're debating that, there, there's an issue. So, um, the, the problem that arises with post-realism, right? So there's a lot of great things. Uh, 
new theories, new ways of thing, seeing things constrained by a single minded focus on following through the consequences of a given framework, applying rigorous and rational empirical principles to examine and test them um, to do so in such a way where uh, we don't fall into a world of relativism, where everyone thinks that they can just say what they want to be true is true. All that. Fantastic. Problem is we give up believing that there is a right to be found. Well, there is a right to be found, right? We don't want to give up the idea that there is an objective truth because there is an objective truth. All right. So that's that's the problem with post-realism. There's a lot of interesting and positive qualities about post-realism. But the part that, that definitely absolutely separates it from Hyperionism is that Hyperionism absolutely posits that there is an objective truth to be found and that we can find it. And this is done through reason. This is done through the laws of mathematics, understanding ontological mathematics, understanding how uh, reality rationally operates and coming to the uh, conclusions based on that and not being not being swayed by any of our biases or what we want to be true. And it's not what we want to be true. It's what we understand to be true through the use of reason and through the use of understanding reality. And then we have a goal for this as well, our goal being to apply this to ourselves and the world to increase the quality of life of every individual and the collective. And that, that is our teleological goal. And the way that we achieve that is through um, our understanding of existence, what we are, where we are, and why we're here. Because when we understand what we are, where we are, and why we're here, if we really understand that, and, and, and if, if one 100% understands that, they become hyper aware. But I mean, you have to one, so many people think they do or have a very partial understanding. When I say really understand it, I don't mean it takes years of dedicated study, understanding to truly know what that means. But once, once, once that is attained, everything just follows from that. I'm not going to go out and, you know, try and murder or steal someone just like I wouldn't try and cut off my own hand because I realize that it's detrimental to myself and ourself and the collective because we're all in this together. So anyway, long story short, um, realism has become the god of scientific materialism and um, empiricism. This idea that a mind independent reality exists, it's an absurd position because it itself is not observable. By definition, it can never be observed because that includes a mind to do the observing. And uh, Hyperionism agrees with the fact that this causes division, this causes um, strife, this causes so much misunderstanding, and we need to overcome all of this, realize the truth about ourselves, the truth about existence, and that is ultimately, ultimately, by spreading this information, spreading, that's why spreading this information is so important. How are we going to change this world? This is a war of ideas. This is a war of the mind. Look at how much ideas influence. Ideas influence everything. Everything starts with an idea. When humans come on the scenes, the scene and consciousness, that's when ideas, consciously generated ideas, start uh, dominating because, you know, like wars are fought. That, that seems like a very physical sort of thing. Yes, it is a very physical sort of thing, but that war was initiated and begun by an idea. You know, countries are formed by an idea. Governments are formed by ideas. Corporations are formed by an idea. Products are made from ideas, inventions, from I, all of this. This is a war of the mind. This is a war. Ideas are everything. So the way we change the world is spreading this information, spreading these ideas, getting this information out there. And ultimately, this helps raise, literally raise humanity's consciousness, not any woo-woo mysticism, new age way. Literally, it literally does so in a very, you know, I have this in the book that I'm currently writing, very rigorously, rigorously defined. It's not some sort of airy fairy concept. Spreading this information, spreading these ideas, having a humanity understand, at least the leaders of tomorrow understand what they are, where they are, and why they're here, so that we can lead humanity to a world where our goal is increasing the quality of life of every individual and the collective. So instead of fighting tooth and nail every single day to survival, we can finally start to live and enjoy life and enjoy each other. Wouldn't that be nice? It's not a pipe dream. That should be bare minimum. Bare, that should be bare minimum. And that's where we will begin. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, my friends. I know I went on a very long time and uh, I didn't read much of the article at all, but I hope you enjoyed it. I mentioned a couple, there's a lot of videos that I've done. Check out the different videos on my channel for more, you know, I can't talk about every single, single subject or this would be hours long. So check out the different videos on my channel um, for that. 
And uh, I also want to give a big shout out to everyone that supports on Patreon, especially Renaissance Fairy, Trent, Cassidy, Michael, Evie, Alan, Angela, Maria, Brian, Chubby Bunny, and High Expectations Counseling. It means a lot. If you ever feel like that you've gotten something or learned something from my videos, consider supporting on Patreon. It helps out a lot. It's how I'm able to do my videos, do my live streams, do my work. Um, seriously. Uh, means the world. That's how I'm able to do what I am. You'll get access uh, do what I do. You'll get access to our weekly secret live streams, our hidden Discord server, the Citadel, and a lot more. The link should pop up right over here in a minute. And thank you. I appreciate it very much.